land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from my top secret broadcasting bunker. This is Pastor Mike and I'm online. I'm live with you today picking up where the Watchman broadcast leads off. Um, I want to try to go back, do what I was going to do yesterday. Matthew chapter 24. And this really is going to be picking up where the Watchman uh, leaves off. Right now in the Watchman series, we are doing Matthew chapter 24 and uh, talking about the the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood. And now we're at the point where the stars of heaven are going to fall. And uh, I'm working on the script now for the next Watchman broadcast. What is going to happen on this earth when those stars come down here? It is probably, um, I, I would say, the most significant prophesied event. And when I say prophesied, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say prophesied both from Scripture and the devil's side, whether it's the occult, the New Age, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, whatever, because all of all of those groups, and this this kind of threw me for a while studying prophecy years ago, was which conspiracy theory do I believe? Who's in charge? Is it the Freemasons? Is it the Vatican? Is it the Council on Foreign Relations? The Trilateral Commission? Who? I mean, they're all they're all in on it. They're all in on it. Um, Freemasonry has a goal in mind and that is the, the brotherhood of all mankind the unity of all mankind it has an aim an end and so their means bring about an end and the end is to join the square and the compass together what that is, is the fourth kingdom and the kingdom of the Antichrist, the, the powers of Satan literally ruling over planet Earth. So, yeah, it, that, that event of the stars coming down to the Earth um, is the biggest, in, in my estimation, the biggest thing to happen ever and it and it is what uh if you remember back in the late 60s there was a group called the fifth dimension and they sing this is the dawning of the age of aquarius well they were off by several years but the age, the aquarian age has to do with the aquarian conspiracy marilyn ferguson in her book in 1980 uh, and proclaiming that there's coming a day when the heavens are going to be joined with earth. Richard Nixon, when he, when he made that phone call from the Oval Office of the White House to um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon, he said, and of course, this was scripted. He wasn't just, you know, just making stuff up as he went. He said, because of what you've done, the heavens have now become a part of man's world. And he was right. The significance of placing men on the moon and in a permanent place in space, I mean, it's all through the Bible. So the, I, this, this, this day in Matthew 24, when the stars fall from heaven to earth 
is a an extremely significant day. What is going to happen on that day? There are uh, things in the Bible. There are things in uh, movies that I'm going to show you that I think foretell their version of it, of what's going to happen. And like I said in this week's Watchmen, the verse in 2 Thessalonians 2, the passage where Paul said, uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. I can remember the day reading that, and it was like, at that point, I didn't believe any longer the idea that the rapture was the first thing to happen. Because it clearly says that it's not. The falling away takes place first. And on the day, <clears throat> excuse me, I am still not, uh, I've not been cleared up of the bronchitis that I had two weeks ago. It's still hanging around there. But any, and, and my voice is just not as strong as it was since then, um, especially my singing voice. Uh, it's just very weak for some reason. But anyway, um, the significance of that day and its relation to the translation of the church, the rapture, uh, I think are highly important. That and that day is coming, but they're uh, they're according to Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. There are things that happen before that, and I want to go through um, a couple of things in Matthew 24, starting in verse 29, that. Um, I ha I'm not going to deal with in the Watchman broadcast, but I am going to do it here. Um, just as a, a, like a side note to what's happening in the Watchman. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. And then tomorrow, tomorrow, I, I want you to tune in tomorrow. I've, I've decided and, and found out today that the the mark of the beast the new world order they're not going to microchip anybody it, it, well let me say let me say it this way they're not going to microchip anybody and that be the mark of the beast they don't need to not anymore Got an email today. Um, I always check to see if this is a hoax or not. And it's not. And I'll tell you what I mean by that tomorrow. But for those of you, and, and I want you to listen to me just for a minute. Um, you know, I, I, I remember when the, when the implantable chip came out in the 90s there was a company called digital angel and that got my attention all right um i don't i i'm just i'm just kind of working through this but i don't think the mark of the beast is a microchip implant i don't i don't think it is they don't need it anymore they have better technology than that. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. You can agree or disagree. We'll just see what happens. Uh, but, yeah, we'll talk about that tomorrow, all right? Amazon. <clears throat> Amazon. I, I kind of tipped my hand. Amazon's got something out now is where we're going with this tomorrow. Matthew 24. My Freudian slip is showing, isn't it? Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 <clears throat> Excuse me. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened? Um, and in the watchman, we dealt with that. The sun. The sun represents Christ. 
the light of the world and so on, that's darkened. Men's minds are being darkened. The moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall, uh, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, verses 30 and 31 are what we're going to deal with today. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. One of the things that uh, I preached last Sunday um, concerning prayer is that uh, God doesn't always answer our prayers the moment we, we pray them. We, we wish he would. And sometimes we get little upset with God when he doesn't do things in our time. God, I, I prayed this. Now, aren't you going to do it? The Bible says you're going to do it. So why don't you do it? Well, with God, everything is timing. Everything is about his, and it's his timing, his purpose, his plan. God doesn't rush things. He doesn't shorten things. He doesn't lengthen things. He, he's, he does it the way he wants to do it. And we have the guy Gideon. I was preaching on him Sunday. Gideon was always looking for a sign of something. And uh, this Sunday, uh, last Sunday I preached about Gideon and he went and killed the kid and, and, and boiled it and took the broth and made cakes of bread and the kid and brought it. And the angel of the Lord said, pour the broth out on the ground. So he pours it out on the ground. And then he set the bread and the, the meat on the rock and he touched it with his uh, rod and it consumed up in the fire and it's gone. That's God saying, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I don't accept your gifts. And, God, and the point of that to Gideon was, that was God's way of saying, I'm not going to do this for you because you gave me a present. I'm doing it for you because I love you. Which is what God told Israel in, uh, I think, Deuteronomy chapter 4. He said, I'm not, I didn't call you because you were the greatest nation in the world concerning Israel. I didn't call you because you were the biggest nation in the world or the best looking or the brightest people in the world or whatever. I didn't call you because of that. I called you because I loved you. I set my love upon you. That's why I did it. Not because you gave me some gifts. When you hear the, the TV preachers spew out their pleas for money, telling you that if you give to their ministry, then God will return that back to you sevenfold or tenfold or a hundredfold or whatever fold they want. They're and they're telling you that God has to do it because you gave him a gift. One, one TV preacher actually said, you're loaning money to God. And God is going to pay you back with interest. And that just, all that made me angry. Because the Bible teaches that the, the borrower is servant to the lender. That makes God our, that makes God our servant. We can boss God, tell him to do whatever we want. And give us whatever we want and do for us whatever we want. Whatever we demand, God has to do it because he owes us money. It's like the mafia. And it just, that stuff just angers me. But the idea that Gideon went through that whole thing and all of his offering, that he, all of his gift that he gave to the angel of the Lord went up in smoke. And God signifying that I don't accept gifts and I don't do for you what I'm doing for you on the basis of what you do for me. What I'm doing for you, I'm doing by grace because I love you, because I want to do this for you. Unmerited favor is what grace is all about. But anyway, Gideon wanted a sign. And I, <clears throat> I, I would tell people that if you're praying and God doesn't answer immediately, I, I do think it's 
well within reason for you to ask God to help you wait on him and if he wants to give you a sign or a token that he is going to do what you asked him to do he'll and that way he can he can use that to keep you faithful remember what paul said in ephesians chapter 1 um that the the gift of the holy spirit in us is a token of of it's like an earnest when you uh let's say you go to a used car lot and you're gonna you look at a car and you say i really like this car and you know the high pressure salesman says well you better buy it now because i mean i've got 10 people looking at this same car he doesn't really but anyway i've got 10 people looking at this same car and if you if you wait a day it'll, it probably won't be here well l let me put some earnest money down which is a token it's a it's a sign saying I want the car I've got some things to take care of don't sell the car out from underneath me and here is the earnest payment to show you that I mean to do what I said I was going to do then the car salesman would be obligated to hold that car for you because he's got your money and in Ephesians uh, chapter 1 Verse 13, in whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So one of the things that God has done in us is given us the earnest of his spirit. That's the token and the sign that God intends to fulfill his promises to us and that he's not going to fail us in that. And I, I will say that one of those, one of those of the spirit is the fear of the Lord. If you still have a fear of the Lord, you've got the earnest sign and token in you that God is going to fulfill his word in you. If you still fear God, if you still fear God, and I do, I know what God can do to me. I know it because he's done it before. And I don't want him to do it again. So in that sense, yes, I do fear the Lord. I have the spirit of the fear of the Lord in me. And I have a high respect for God and what he is able to do to me. And, in, and because of that, I'm blessed knowing that God still loves and God still cares about me. And he's going to perform his word to me. He's going to keep his promises to me. I'm going to be in that resurrection, whether by death or if I am alive and remain on that day, I'm going to be in that resurrection. Because the spirit of the fear of the Lord is in me, and that's the sign. So, at, but God was God is the one who instituted this idea of giving signs to show you uh, this is what I'm going to do, and I I pro it's my promise. Here's the sign of my promise: I wear a wedding ring as a sign to my wife, to myself and to everybody else that I made a promise to my wife to keep myself only under her so long as we both shall live. And the, and the ring is the token of that covenant. You understand that? Now, in, back in Matthew 24, verse 30, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. What is his sign? What is it that is going to show up that is going to confirm in us that Christ is now ready to do what he said he was going to do? Because it's only been, what, 2,000 years? That's quite a bit of time. 
Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What is the sign of Jesus coming? He's coming in the clouds. What did he say to... Well, let me finish reading this. There's two things in these two verses. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then verse 31, And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So we're, we're, we're watching and listening. Number one, we're looking for the clouds. Number two, we're listening for the trumpet. Paul specifically then gives us which trumpet? The last one. At the last trump. Now, uh, when Pontius Pilate was, uh, I think that's the context of it. No, the high priest in Matthew 26 the high priest arose, this verse 62, and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these things, which, which these witness against thee? And Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Woo! Then the priest rent his clothes. Uh, uh, anger. Blasphemy! He speaketh blasphemy. And But Jesus meant it. Uh, when you look in Acts chapter 1, the token, the sign of, the, the signet of the promise that Jesus is going to do what he said he's going to do. Um, verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Oh, I get chills thinking of it. Uh, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Kind of a silly question for angels to ask, isn't it? I would be. I, I would be going. Did you just see that? Yeah, I just saw that. What do you do? How do you go about your normal day after that? You don't. You live in freak out land the rest of the day. And you tell everybody, guess what we saw? Whether they believe you or not. You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. What did Luke say in Luke 21? Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. It's, it's come. Lift up your heads. I'm looking for those clouds. That what, so what, what precipitates, pardon the pun, what precipitates uh, the translation? The clouds. When you see the clouds coming, get ready. Um, Revelation. Turn to Revelation 1. This is the sign of the Son of Man. And again, you know, there's people have all of these reasons why they don't believe that the passage we just read in Matthew, Matthew 24, 29, 30, and 31, they have all these reasons why they don't believe that that is the rapture. And, and again, I can't, I'm, I don't want to be anybody's enemy. I don't want to argue or debate it. 
Um, I can't just change my mind because you want me to. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't ignore what I'm seeing in these verses. The fact that Jesus is going to appear in the air, in the clouds, the fact that it's going to be at the sound of a trumpet is pretty much precisely what the Bible tells us the rapture is all about, especially 1 Thessalonians 4. That then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And, and it will come at the sound of a trumpet. Paul mentions 1 Corinthians 15, 51, that it's the last trump. For the trump shall sound and uh, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So I, I just, I can't, I can't put Matthew 24, 29, 30, and 31, I can't put them in any other place other than immediately after the days of immediately after tri after the tribulation of those days i can't put it anywhere else other than where jesus himself put it and i can't look at those verses knowing what else the bible says about the rapture and the signs associated with it I can't, I can't say that that's not the rapture. I, can't, I just can't do it. So, like I said, when you, when you read everybody's books on prophecy, you may come up with ideas that don't line up with God's book of prophecy. And it's like uh, we were talking about Todd Friel last week and Calvinism. You, you'll you never just read the Bible and invent Calvinism out of it. You never will because it doesn't, it doesn't match Scripture. You'll never, you'll never read the Scripture and say, I didn't get a choice in being saved. I read that clearly in the Scripture. It wasn't my idea. Don't blame me for being, don't blame me for salvation. I didn't do it. That you never, you'll never get that out of Scripture. You get it out of books and from what other people say, but you just you won't get it from reading the scripture. Boy, I wish I wish we would all just read the Bible. Amen. Um, <clears throat> what was oh John John chapter one. Um, let's see here. Where where are we looking for John chapter one? Um. Where does it say it in Revelation? He's coming in the clouds. Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So when he comes, he's coming with the clouds. That's the sign of his coming. Now, what what kind of clouds? What what's what what is there a symbol related to that, or is clouds a symbol of something? Turn to uh, Hebrews twelve, and I like this verse, and and it's actually it's related, I think, to a couple of different things, as is a lot of signs and things in the Bible. Um, they're attached to more than just one thing. Hebrews chapter twelve. Uh, verse 1, where, and Hebrews 12, if we were to read all of Hebrews 11, we would get the context of Hebrews 12. Hebrews 11 speaks of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Sarah, Gideon, Samson, Rahab the harlot, et al all these people they call it the faith hall of fame who pleased god not by their works but by faith for it says without faith in verse 6 it is impossible to please him for he that cometh him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek 
him. So in that context, all of those saints that he just mentioned are a cloud. Because he says in Hebrews 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed or compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And I believe that Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Sarah, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, Rahab the harlot, all of these people are going to be there on that day. They died in Christ even before Christ made himself known to them. Okay? They worship God. Christ is God. They, are, they were saved by grace through faith. I know the hyper-dispensational people don't believe that. I don't care. Don't care at all. Water off a duck's back to me. One gospel saved everybody forevermore. And these are a great cloud of witnesses that come past us about. And we're going to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And again, I, I, I want to comfort you. Not fight you. Not beat you up. Not tell you how wrong you are. I want to give you comfort and hope that in whatever tribulation you're in, lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. When you see clouds coming, dark, dark clouds are coming to this world. There is, there's another reference to clouds. Um, turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38. Um this is, oh yeah, there it is. Ezekiel 38, the invasion of angels. The invasion of angels. In Ezekiel 38, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. A chief prince is a principality, and Gog is that chief prince, that high-ranking prince. He is a, a, an angel of the angelic realm, an evil angel, a devil, a god, little g, um, an unclean spirit, familiar spirit, whatever. Um, and, and he rules over a company of people. Um, and he said, uh, verse three and say, thus saith the Lord, behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, thou chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. And I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, Horses and horsemen, I think, is a reference to Revelation 9. Horses and horsemen and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, I, and let's, let's look at Revelation 9 and kind of get an idea of what I'm... What are you talking about, Brother Mike? Revelation 9. Um, in Revelation 9, 7... The description of the army that comes up out of the pit is given to us. In verse 7 of Revelation 9, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. 
And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women. They were androgynous gods, male and female in the same body, like Bacchus or, or Dionysus, the god of wine. Bacchus, the god of wine parties. They call them tastings. Okay? But the, the god of the God who gets everybody drunk at the party, that's Dionysus. And he has the hair of women, he has the face of man, he has feminine parts and masculine parts. Da Vinci's drawing of angel in the flesh. Look that up, but make sure the kids aren't in the room. Trust me. Angel in the flesh. It is an androgynous creature that da Vinci used to base his favorite portrait, John the Baptist, on. All right. Uh, anyway, in verse 9, they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. So, and again, going back to Ezekiel 37, the big question that I have is if this is a, if this is, let's say this, forget about the spirits, Say it's Russia, like Jack Van Impey always said. This is Russia. If it's Russia and Germany, why are they fighting Israel with horses? Why are they, why are they riding on horses? Horses nowadays are the worst way or the best way to lose a war. And Oh, Carrying swords and using spears and riding horses today is the best way to lose a battle. In the, bat in the 21st century battlefield, when you show up with bows and arrows, riding on a horse, you just might as well surrender right then and there because that tank is going to blow you up. Or the ship out in the Gulf is going to start firing rockets and raining rockets down upon your horse's head. So, my question is, if this is a future battle, why in the world are they riding horses and using spears and swords to fight it? Why is Russia, why is Russia, the old Soviet Union, who had spent billions of dollars, the Soviet Union, I watched a little documentary on Leonid Brezhnev, who basically run Khrushchev out of office. And um, Brezhnev took over. Brezhnev used to be in charge of the, uh, of the army the defense and now he's in charge of the soviet union and he he agrees that you know if we start firing nukes at america america's going to fire back and we're just going to do nothing but nuke each other and, and nobody's going to win but they still kept building their military and building their military and what they did was they bankrupted the country nobody you couldn't get a piece of sausage from the store. The stores had no food at all in the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, all of us Americans are eating buffets, okay? And so, but Russia, why would Russia throw away all of their tanks, uh, personnel carriers, armored vehicles, helicopters, jets, bombs, Machine guns, 50 caliber guns, cannons. Why would they throw all of that away, ride down to Israel on horseback with a sword in their hand? Why would they do it? 
I don't believe they are. I believe this army is a spirit, is an army of angels. Now, when angels ride horses and carry swords, there isn't a bomb in the world that can stop them. Not one. So this, it has to be a spirit army. It has to be an army of devils. Has to be. And so anyway, verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with all of them, all of them with shield and helmet. Again, unless, unless their shields are all made of vibranium, like Captain America's is, they're, they're going to lose. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north, there it is, the north quarters. And all his bands and many people with thee, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, be thou a guard at, unto them. And after many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter days thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely all of them. Thou shalt, here, here it is in verse 9. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Think about it. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up into the land of unwalled villages. I will go unto them that are at rest, that dwell safely of all them, dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. To take a spoil and to take a prey and to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Um, verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, that saith, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from the pla thy place out of the north parts. There it is. They're coming from the place where there's no land whatsoever. Out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come against thy people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before thy eyes. And I wrote here a note years ago when I saw that. I said, that's a day of clouds. A day of clouds. So let's look that's that's a that's an actual phrase in the Bible. Day of cloud of course naturally I can't type today. Day of clouds, Joel chapter two. Turn there. In fact, let's turn to Joel. Let's go to Joel. And let's look at that. So you get you get it now. You understand what he's what he's saying here. That the day of the Lord is a day of clouds. The day of Christ. He's coming in. When, when we see these clouds coming, then lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. Because when we see these clouds, Christ is going to be in those clouds. God promised us that he would be. Uh, I'm in Zephaniah. Go, go back. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. There we go. Look in Joel chapter 1. Um, verse 3. Tell ye 
Tell ye, ye, that's, that's you, your children, that's your second generation, and let your children tell their children, that's the third generation, and their children another generation, fourth generation. Think about it. That which the palmer worm hath left hath a locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Four types. Four spirits. This is your fourth kingdom. It is God's mighty army. The locusts connect you right back again to Revelation 9. Just like the, the horses and the horsemen of the army of Gog point you to Revelation 9. So does this one. Um, verse 5 of Joel 1. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. And people, I, I, I just I want to encourage you please re start reading your Bible again. Pick it up, read it, put it back down. Somebody called me, they said, you know, my brain doesn't, it just, I don't remember scriptures. I read it, but I don't memorize it very well. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I believe that our brains store just about everything that we do. Now, having the ability to pull those memories out, that's the hard part. But I will tell you this. Once you read Scripture, the Holy Ghost knows how to pull it out when it's time. And I believe God will bring Scriptures out of you that you've read, that you, you would say, you know, I remember reading that verse, but I didn't know I had it memorized. It was the Holy Ghost. Okay? So just read it. And I will tell you this. This, this verse here, Wake ye drunkards and all you drinkers of wine, if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not drinking from the Word of God, you are drinking something else. You are. You're feeding yourself and your mind and your spirit with other things, but it's not new wine. And I, I would just say in an encouraging way that if you're not reading your Bible and you are feeding off of other things, it may be that God has removed the new wine from you. And I want you to consider how dangerous that, that being in that position is. Because God, when God removes it from you, you can't get it back unless he gives it to you. Uh, you know my testimony. I grew up here in this church as a solid King James Bible believer. Three years of Bible college is all it took. And then I don't believe it anymore. God took that out of me. He did it for a reason. And I wandered in that wilderness for several years. And it was only by God's grace. I didn't snatch it back from God's hands. He gave it back to me. It was a gift from him. He didn't have to do it. But he did it anyway. And I just want to encourage you to cut off reading all the other stuff that you're reading, especially Especially when it comes to prophetic things and read your Bible. Or God may just say, you know what? You want to drink that slop? 
I'll let you be drunk with it. Because it's nothing but the vine of Sodom. Uh, uh, by the way, did you, I, I, I won't play this video. But I, it was sent to me, these, the Sodomites now have a, have a, a choir, glee club. And they made it, they said it in no uncertain terms that our job is to brainwash your children so that they believe that our lifestyle is a legitimate lifestyle. I'm, I'm, they're going after your kids. And you're going to let them do it. Why would you do that? I, I, I could see it in Genesis 19. When the Sodomites came to Lot's house because of the angels... The Bible says that they came both young and old. How do you think that most people end up being sodomites? An old sodomite got to them when they were young. That is normally how it happens. I wouldn't say that in every case. That is normally how it happens. So, I'm telling you, read your Bible. And don't feed off the vine of Sodom. God is commanding us to awake out of our drunkenness. Weep and howl, you drinkers of wine. The new wine is cut off from your mouth. Verse 6, for a nation has come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. That's Revelation 9, and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Revelation 9. And see, this is, this is a cloud now that's coming over the land. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Now look in uh, chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet. See how the trumpet's linked to this. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of, and there's four things here in verse 2. It's a day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Wow. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And you're worried about Joe Biden. Well, I am too a little bit, but not near as much as I am concerned about this group of people. Because this group of people here, there's never been anybody like them. Never. On this earth. They came, they're coming from the north. Because in, in chapter 3, God calls them the northern army. The, uh, he said, I'll, I'll take the northern army back off of you. So they are the northern army. They are the locust army. They are, they will come as a cloud to cover the land. And they're coming at the onset of the day of the Lord, which is a day of darkness, gloominess, clouds, and thick darkness. Okay. Um, in Exodus 19... When the people were going to meet with God on Mount Sinai, what did they see? What did they see on top of the mountain? Clouds. Thick cloud. When the Lord comes, he's coming how? In fact, let's do that. Let's go to Exodus 19. 
Um, man, I'm having fun today. I hope you are. I got an old cathedral song in my mind. When Jesus comes in the clouds. Um, yeah, look at this. Exodus 19. Um, let's see here. Verse 9. The Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. And I'm just, I'm just telling you, when the Lord comes, that's the sign of his coming. And, and, and it could very well be that God is saying that over and over and over and over again so that we don't get him confused with another Jesus. And I, I think it's possible that the other Jesus, when he comes, there'll be no clouds. In this case here, though, he said, Behold, I, I come... Uh, I come unto I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Now think of this as a prophecy, not just a his, uh, a historical event. Think of it as a future event that God is saying this about what is going to happen. Let me read it again. Lo, I come to thee in a thick cloud. Yes, Lord, that's what we're looking for that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. That's why I'm coming to you this way, that they will believe what God said. And they're going to. And he said in verse um, 10, The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their hands. This is a third day time prophecy. The third day, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So two days or 2,000 years since Christ's first coming. Now he's coming again on the third day. And verse 11, be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. What did we just read um, in um, Revelation? Behold, he cometh in the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they that pierced him. His appearing in the clouds is going to be witnessed by everybody on the earth. And no, it's not going to be on CNN. Well, it might be, but that's not how they're going to see it. They're going to look up. Now, the, the flat earth people came up with this theory. If Jesus appears to everybody, how can he do that if the earth is round? He can. Get over it. Good grief. Anyway, be ready against the third day. And then... Um, Oh, look at this. I got to keep reading. Thou shalt set bounds unto the people. Take uh, round about. It's saying, take heed to yourselves that ye go uh, not up into the mountain or, or touch the border of it. And whosoever toucheth the mount shall, shall be surely put to death. And that was how I ended this week's Watchman broadcast was in Hebrews. So we're not coming to this mount that, that if we touch it, we'll die. We're coming to Mount Zion in New Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem, uh, to the assembly of the firstborn. We're coming to a, to a better place than Mount Sinai, to get a better covenant than the one at Mount Sinai. And he said, uh, verse 13, There shall not in hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man, and it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Look at that! Look at that! Mountains are a picture of heaven. Valleys, picture of hell. Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third. There's so much prophecy here. So much prophetic typology. 
Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were, th see it happens at the very beginning of the millennial reign. Very, very early in the morning. How many times do you see that in the Bible? And it came to pass that there rose up early in the morning. That's telling you it takes place at the very, very beginning, I believe, of the, the, the day of the Lord, early in the morning. Um, third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings. The seven thunders, think about that. And a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. So now we have the combination of the two things that Jesus said in Matthew 24. You shall see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with the great sound of a trumpet. He shall send his angels to gather them, to gather the, his elect, from the four winds, from the uh, from one end of heaven to the other, and from from the ends of the earth, both in heaven and earth, no matter where they are, they're all going to be gathered together. His angels are going to get. We're we're like the wheat gathered together. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, but what gets gathered first? The tares. The falling away takes place. So you know what happens, don't you? The sickle comes down, cuts the tares, and they bind them and they cast them down. They're not standing any longer. That while the weed is still standing up, the tares have been cut down. You see it? In verse 17, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. I just, I love this! Uh, and verse 18, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord has descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. Did you see that? Did you see that? Hold your place there. Read that again. The smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. Go back to Revelation 9. What does it say there? Aren't you glad that you just believe one Bible? One, one Bible only. Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose the smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. As the smoke of a furnace. Mm. And the whole mount quaked greatly. The shaking is taking place. So the shaking takes place. There is a falling away, there is a trumpet, there is the cloud. That's when we go to heaven. That's when we're translated up. That's when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Mm -mm -mm. Beautiful stuff here. Um, let's see here. Where else do I want to go? There were some other um, references. Let's see here. That talked about the day of the Lord. Yeah, Zephaniah. Zephaniah 115. This is a day of wrath, a day of trouble. Let me back up to verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. See, Joel says almost the same thing here, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Then he said in verse 16, a day of the trumpet 
an alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither shall their, listen to this people, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, I believe is the same thing. I cannot, I cannot see a difference. And some people say, well, the day of the Lord is different from the day of Christ. Well, okay, if the day of Christ then is the day when Christ appears in the clouds, then we go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, that the day of Christ is at hand, um, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. It still basically says that a falling away takes place and the man of sin is revealed first before our gathering together unto him at the day of Christ. But I just believe that the day of the Lord, see the Lord is Christ. The day of the Lord and the day of Christ are the same day. They are the same thing. And remember, a day is both 24 hours and a thousand years. So they are one and the same. God's going to initiate certain things on a certain day and then continue that for that thousand years, if that makes sense to you. Um, let's go to Genesis 9. And we'll just kind of wrap this up here. I, I love this study. This, uh, this is one of my favorite things here. Genesis, the number 9 is a number for fruit bearing. Um... And that's what he says in the very first verse of Genesis 9. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Be fruitful. Being fruitful means being having the fruit of the Spirit present in our lives. Let's go to the Galatians, which is, what is that? The ninth book of the New Testament, right? And you read it in chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So let's love one another. Let's, let's ask God to manifest His fruit in us. Where we love the brethren. Now, let me just give you an example of this, and I'm not tooting my own horn. Last week, as you know, it was a hard, very difficult, and, and yesterday I was not doing well at all. Um, over the, the death of my son's girlfriend. She, she, she had gotten very close, especially to Lisa. And, um, you know, I just, I kept thinking about the accident yesterday. It was hard, hard day. Um, their pastor, you know, I'm reasonably sure he doesn't use a King James. Or didn't. Okay. Now, I'm told to love this man. Not hate him. Not roll my eyes at him. Not judge him. I'm told to love him. 
And the first time I met him, uh, Caleb had gone to a, a prayer thing that they had at their church. And I shook his hand <clears throat> and I said, brother, I want you to let, I want to let you know I'm going to be praying for you. I said, I know the task that you have at hand. I had to preach uh, the funeral of a 13-year-old neighbor girl that her daddy bought her a four-wheeler on her birthday but didn't buy her a helmet. And she died that day on that four-wheeler. And I had, to pre I, had to, I had to preach the funeral and talk the mom out of committing suicide. And I said, I just want you to know that um, God's laid it on my heart and I'm going to be praying for you. He said, brother, I appreciate that. I told him I pastored here in Festus. So then I met him at the visitation last Tuesday. And we just, I enjoyed talking to him. Wednesday morning, the day of the funeral, <clears throat> when he arrived, he was standing outside the door of the funeral home. And I had walked, I was walking out to my car to get something. But when I saw him standing there, I just went over to him and I said, brother, can I pray for you now? Uh, before before the uh, service he said would you please and right there people coming in I didn't care I just laid my arms around this man and I prayed for him legitimately that God would use him mightily that God would give him love that God would that, that God would put the words in his mouth that he wanted him to speak and I was, I personally was blessed doing that. Now, I don't know what the guy kn knows about me. I don't know what he thinks of me. It's it, it, totally irrelevant. You got to love people. Maybe, maybe he's not there yet. Like I wasn't there years ago. Don't judge everybody don't do it there is a greater fruit to manifest than just if you notice here in the fruits of the spirit that are manifest in God's people judging everybody is not one of them take a look at the list casting judgment on everybody that you know that doesn't believe what you believe is not in this list of the fruits of the Spirit. Love is. Love people. Be patient with them. Be kind to them. Be merciful to them. Love them. Care about them. And, I, and I'm, I'm preaching to me too. Joy. Have, let, ask God to manifest an inner joy in you uh, that it's not laughter. It's just an inner joy that you have that keeps you going. Peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. People might look at you and say, how can you, with what you've gone through, how can you have peace in your heart? My church secretary, she's been our church secretary, my goodness, 30 years or better here at this church. She was scheduled to have open heart surgery today. Uh, they put it off till tomorrow because she was on a blood thinner, they found out. But I talked to her yesterday, and she says, I have peace about this. I have perfect peace about it. God gave her that peace. God put that in her. He'd have to. And I want you to continue to pray for her. That's a manifestation of the gift of the Spirit. Peace. Long-suffering. That means that instead of judging everybody, long-suffering is the opposite of judging everybody. Judging everybody means you wrote them off. I'm done with you. Get away from me. And I, I'd listen, I would have to admit that that's in my nature. I don't like it, but it's in there. All of these things are contrary to the flesh. 
but it's a manifestation of God's true spirit in you that you long suffer with people and that you're kind to them and that you don't write them off and you don't throw them at. We don't bayonet the wounded. Uh, gentleness, not being a brawler over everything. And again, I, I just, I want to say to everybody, I've got a guy in me that I don't like. That when you, if you call here wanting to argue with me, I, I'm not going to enjoy it. I don't like it. Because it brings out this guy that I hate, and he doesn't say things nice. I don't like him. And so, I, I just, it's, it's not that I don't want to be corrected. I do. But I'm like everybody else. You can push a button on me and bing, here comes this other guy out that I just don't, I don't want him out. Um, and he's not very kind. He's not very gentle. And I've, I've spent years trying to keep him in and not let him out. I'd rather be gentle. I'd rather be gentle with my wife, gentle with my children, gentle with church members, gentle with people on the phone, gentle, be a gentle man. That's what I want to be, goodness. Having, having a, 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 a personal goodness to where I don't have to be watched all day long. I don't have to be guarded over all day long. When I'm alone and in private, I'm still going to do the right thing. And then faith is a manifestation of God's Spirit. You just believe the Bible more. Meekness and temperance. All of these things relate to how we deal with other people. Did you notice that? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of these things deal with how we deal with other people that are not like us or don't believe what we believe or didn't come from the same background we did or whatever. And I, I in my flesh, I am not any of these so if these things are to be manifest in me, they, they must be of the Spirit. Now, back in Genesis 9. I love this. In verse 9, he said, I, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And that's true. God's not going to destroy the earth with a flood. He's going to do it with fire. Not with a flood, but with a fire. There is, however, a flood coming. And it is a flood of the wicked. A flood of ungodliness or a flood of ungodly men. Those waves are going to roll over. And if your house is built on sand, it is going to be discovered and it's going to be destroyed. Um, then he says, verse 12, and God said, this is the token. Remember, the sign. I'm going to give you a sign. So that for all generations, you won't forget that I said this. And I won't forget it either. A token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. Now the bow is Ezekiel 1. As Eric Von Daniken would say, God lighting the spaceship. 
to Earth. Um, Gen- Ezekiel chapter 1, as the, verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And it's, and it's the Son of Man. It's Christ. The bow is light diffused and it shows the seven colors. There are seven color bands in light. Who do you think who do you think invented that? Who do you think made that? You think it made itself? No way. It's Christ. These are like a light picture of the seven spirits of God. And um, so Christ is the bow. And he said, uh, I, verse 13 again, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth. Somebody say amen. It shall be for um, when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. That's Christ coming in the clouds. When? When the clouds come over, well, what are the clouds? Well, we read Gog and Magog and all of his armies. We read Joel and the army in the book of Joel. Those are the clouds that are coming to cover the land. Plus the great cloud of witnesses, the dead in Christ. Verse 15, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. I love it. So d- does it make sense to you? Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sign of the Son of Man. He's coming in the clouds on that day. And when he does, he's going to send his angels forth with the great sound of a trumpet to gather together his elect unto himself. And I just don't... I can't, I can't unsee that. I can't unlearn it. And I can't dismiss it because it is exactly what God said. And, and I'll just, and whether I like it or not, I think what God said makes a lot better sense than what man says. That's just what I think. It matches scripturally and causes me not to have to brush away other scriptures. And I think, I think, well, I know that if I were to go back then and accept seven year tribulation and the rapture happens if I were to accept that I would have to brush away a lot of scriptures that I know now and I and I just can't do that just can't do it uh, come join with us this evening 7 o'clock central for our Wednesday night Bible study and uh, continue to pray for our ministry pray for me God will give me clarity of thought on the next Watchman broadcast. I'm kind of having trouble with the script. So just pray that God will help me along as I work on that. And then, uh, the Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. You're the reason why we do what we do.